and we'll um, ask the questions at the very end. And we are pleased to provide closed captioning during this program. If you would like to view these closed captions, please click the CC Live Transcript button in the toolbar and select Show Subtitle. And now I'd like to introduce our guest today, um, Dr. Monica Ramirez Montagu, who has been the director of the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum at Michigan State University since 2020. Prior to her arrival at the Broad, Dr. Ramirez Montagu was the director of the Newcomb Art Museum at Tulane University, where she was one of the curators of Persister, Incarcerated Women of Louisiana, the exhibition that she will be speaking about today. While at Newcomb, she also organized solo exhibitions of the work by Diana Al-Hadid, Hank Willis Thomas, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Jakaya Booker, and McLean Thomas, among others. In addition to her museum work, Dr. Ramirez Montagut is trained as an architect and has curated exhibitions that feature Frank Lloyd Wright's work and Zaha Hadid's work. She holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the Universidad Iberic Iberoamericana in Mexico City, and her master's and doctorate degrees in architecture from the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. Now, please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Monica Ramirez Montagu. Thank you, Melissa, for a very kind introduction. Uh, you did excellent all the accents and all the pronunciations. I, uh, I'm in awe. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I wanted to give you a presentation on the Persister exhibition. And uh, given that it's a small group, I'm really open to questions, to comments, to interruptions, uh, so that we can turn this from a, from a presentation, a formal presentation, to more addressing kind of like some of the questions or concerns or curiosities that, that brought you all to, to, this, um, to this Zoom meeting today. And given that you're giving us your Saturday afternoon, you know, I wanna make sure that you leave the, the presentation or this gathering, you know, with, with uh, you know, uh, having met some of your expectations. And so I wanted to share a, a PowerPoint that I have pre pre prepared for you um, to try to explain what I wanted to do today is to give you a little bit more of the, of the um backstage thinking for these kind of exhibitions what is a socially engaged ex exhibition we think that this persister exhibition can be a model for that and why do we do socially engaged exhibitions so just to answer that second question um you know i was i was born in mexico city and when i came to new orleans to work at the newcomb art museum of course i wanted to have a close connection with our communities and serve them and meet them where they are and one of the first issues that the community brought my attention to is the issue of mass incarceration in Louisiana, uh, the United States. And so, so that issue, it was an issue that precludes the community uh, to move together forward. And so I wanted to explore why was that? Why was particularly, this issue was particular to Louisiana. It is, it is uh, systemic to the rest of the United States, but it's particularly critical in Louisiana where I was now living. And so uh, it, uh, many of you may know that the United States incarcerates more of its population than any other developed country in the world. Uh, and uh, if you put together all the incarcerated people of all the NATO countries together, the United States incarcerates more uh, than all of those populations together. So this is particular to the United States. And we were interested in seeing like, well, what are the root causes for this? This doesn't happen in other countries. Why does it happen in the United States? And so that was kind of like one, some of the first questions we wanted to answer with this exhibition or explore through the arts. And the other one was well, why uh, Louisiana? Why particularly Louisiana? Louisiana is known as a prison capital of the world. It incarcerates one of, set of every 75 of its own residents. So. Uh, it's very likely that you're, you meet someone from Louisiana, they will probably know someone that knows someone that's in the prison system. This is something that is prevalent in, in the Louisianans and New Orleanian folks everyday life. According to a report from Prison Policy Initiative, there's been an incarcerate, the increase of incarceration of women and girls in the United States in the last 40 years has increased 834%. Women have not changed 834% in the last 40 years. So clearly the system has changed something in the structures of how we decide who needs to be in the prison system and removed from society 
uh, has changed in the 40 year, last 40 years. And what are those changes that are particularly impacting women and girls were some of the questions we were asking ourselves. And so we uh, in the staff, you know, we're a staff that, ha that has expertise in contemporary art in the arts. We did not have anyone in staff that was directly impacted that would be able to tell us, you know, from first experience why they thought this was an issue. And, oh. And so the first thing uh, that we did was recognize that we actually lack the expertise and the competence to be able to do a deep dive with this theme of mass incarceration. So what we did was we held a series of meetings for four years with community members, with faculty members that have talked about that, uh, that subject matter. And we started asking, you know, um, who can guide us through this process? So we found a focus through those several years of community meetings. We decided to focus on, on incarcerated women of Louisiana, uh, given that uh, that 80, 834% that I just spoke about. And we hired two formerly incarcerated women, Sirita Steiff Martin and Dolphinette Martin, who you will meet, I think, uh, the, next, the next program of, of the Syracuse universities with them. So you will get, be able to hear from them directly, which is great. And we invited them to be just our equal partners and co-curators of the exhibition to help us frame, you know, what are the, the questions we need to pose with this exhibition? What are the answers? And to help us navigate all the back end in terms of, you know, um, accountability, which is the next uh, theme here on the slide. What do we mean by that? When working with community, what we didn't have in a normal museum budget was uh, money to pay fees for community stakeholders that while, while the argument is some of us are on this project and we enjoy of salaries, some of the community stakeholders who are directly impacted folks are not getting the benefit of being paid while engaging in this, uh, in this project. So we, um, they let us know early on that we needed to compensate everyone for their time for their brainstorming sessions, for their expertise, for their emotional labor. There was a lot of emotional labor that uh, the women that we interviewed engaged in this project and that, that needed to be acknowledged and compensated. There was also a specific contract that um, when the exhibition travels, some of the rental fees from the exhibition go back to the women. When the artists sold the works that we, commissioned uh, from them for this exhibition. If they sold the work, 20% of, of that sale needed to go to the, to the woman that now they call themselves persisters, the women that participated with us in the exhibition, that 20% of the fee of a sale of an artwork needed to go back to the women and, and different ways of approaching, you know, even the production of the exhibition was, was very different and was shaped by uh, following the lead of our colleagues, Rita and Dolphine, they were the ones that were letting us know how we needed to change our the way that we operate in museums. Um, so what we did is through Sirita and Dolphine, we interviewed 30 formerly incarcerated women at the time based in New Orleans. The exhibition now has changed its title to Incarcerated Women of the United States because many of the women that we interviewed in New Orleans actually served their sentences in federal prisons in states like Florida or Texas. Uh, Louisiana does not have a federal prison. So the women that have committed federal crimes have been deployed to other states. And so we felt that that was also something that was representative of, of the issue uh, in the United States that uh, families are being torn apart. And when, in particular, when the mothers are being sent to serve sentences of three to four years in a different state. So uh, what we found out was that we wanted to ask the exhibition information. Yeah, we wanted to like just get, get a little bit insight of what were the root causes and what, what it was like for the women um, in, in, in their experience and what were the challenges after coming out of the prison system. What we also did was then reach out to 30 local artists and we gave them a little bit of funds for each one of them to create a new artwork inspired by those interviews that we did with the 30 formerly incarcerated women. And we had to focus on formerly incarcerated women because it, it was very difficult at the time to really be able to uh, interview currently incarcerated women um, during Katrina and some hurricanes after Katrina, the, the women's prison flooded and the women are dispersed 
uh, into other facilities. And so they're still in a very precarious situation, but it was really hard for us to be able to uh, establish that relationship we needed for these interviews and that trust. So we decided to work with formerly incarcerated women because we could meet them where they were and we could develop that trust and same with the artists. So we reach out to 30 artists. Some of them are musicians, composers, jazz, jazz composers, hip hop uh, composers, sing song writers, given that New Orleans is famous for its music as well. And so we asked them to read and listen to the interviews that we did of the 30 women. And we also asked each one of the persisters if they wanted to meet the artist that that had been kind of like they, that they had been paired with. And so the artist, if they said yes, the artist would reach out to them and they would collaborate working together. Almost all, all the persisters said that they did want to meet with their artist. Some of them couldn't because they were to be they they had different priorities at the time when this was taking its course. So what you will see is a lot of works that, that the persisters actually met their artists. They did other interviews with their artists. They developed kind of trust and they uh, did these artworks together. This is an artwork dedicated to the journey of Dolphinette Martin, who you will be meeting soon also. And uh, this is by Carl Joe Williams. And this is a quote that I love uh, by, by Dolphine. She says, we want people to understand what some of these quotes are like, why, why, how did this art exhibition help? Why, why would the persisters want to engage with an art museum to tell their stories? What's a win there for them? And so I think Dolphinette is very keen and, and spot on on saying, well, we want people to understand what brought us here, you know, how to have a uh, an experience with a criminal justice system. Every woman or girl that goes to prison has trauma. We're all human and we're all survivors. My crime isn't who I am. And that's the first thing that we learned during this exhibition was never to call the women, you know, ex-convicts or inmates, or just define them by that one, by, by that one experience that they had, or that one, you know, mistake that they did, that, that actually does not define who they are and their identity. So the first thing we learned was to you know, say women that have experienced uh, an encounter with a criminal justice system or formerly incarcerated women, but people first. Uh, I particularly like this work because I think it illustrates how the arts can, can become a vehicle to portray uh, the journey of some of these women. So if you see here uh, in, in this corner here of this piece, so this piece is, it's a, it's a piece that's made, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the art, um, but certainly there's extended labels in the exhibition and you can access the same information in the exhibition. This work by Carl Joe Williams is this, this painting. It's not canvas. I believe it's on, on wood. It's wood and then it has kind of like this kind of like paper mache and a surface treatment on it and an acrylic and painting. But it's a kind of like a wood box that ends here. And then it's extended through this kind of like wallpaper that is then, you know, placed on the wall. But here we see that Dolphinette, if this is, as Carl Joe Williams expresses it, this is Dolphinette Martin, as she, uh, before her encounter with the criminal justice system, she's upside down. There's also a broken mirror underneath this. And uh, this aura kind of like around her, her head is, is a video that's showing these storms, right? Like she has a, a st st storms like surrounding her head, but she has a heart of diamond. And this is kind of a diamond. And for Carl Joe Williams, he explains, and then you know, Dolphinette served time in the prison system and she came out of the prison system with a very clear vision. And also this uh, portrait of Dolphinette, the eyes are actually recorded. So she actually is blinking and looking out. It's a, it's a video monitor that the face is then superimposed, the painted face is superimposed to it. And she comes out with this clear vision with still her heart, you know, her diamond heart shining through. And with this kind of like aura, that expands beyond her individual self into embracing the experience of other women. So let's say that a Dolphinette experience, her life journey is this kind of wood, wood box. The wallpaper that extends beyond the wood box is where she actually, through her work, working with nonprofits and um, helping women transition and re-entry into society, we see this kind of like mug photos of other women that are serving time in the prison system, some numbers that represent the sentencing, the years. Many women serve about six years in and out of the prison system. A lot of men serve more consecutive years. 
uh, and longer as well. And so for College of Williams, this represents, you know, Dolphinette's journey, like her, trans her own transformation, and then the expansiveness of the impact that she has now with her persister, with her community of persisters. And so this is a, and, and what we have here in front is kind of like a sculpture video by Carl Joe Williams, where he re-interviewed uh, Dolphinette. And in this interview, I believe they focused more on Dolphinette's experience as a mother and how difficult it is to be a mother and, and be a parent long distance and the, the impact that it had for her to always be worrying about the, the well-being of her children while she, was, she couldn't really do much when she was inside the prison system to help them or to be there for them. Another important piece that uh, we feel also was one of the one of the manifestations that we were expecting would come from these commissions that we did from the artists is the work for Sirita Stipe Martin, who you will also meet. And uh, Sirita's quote is very important also. She says, it is important that we are focusing on women because the role of women is not just to take care of everybody else. If you fix women, women will fix the world. Sirita and Dolphinette were both very keen on us talking about women um, a, as, a, as a, a, per se, not, not describing women in the function of being mothers or in the function of being sisters or in the function of being wives. Uh, they just wanted to focus on, on women because we tend to not focus on women and the well being of women just because they're not just because they're women and they deserve this attention. And um, so therefore we were not developing other chapters on like, well, how are their children impacted? Let's focus on the children. We focused on the women and rightly so there's other exhibitions that do need to follow up and other themes and other discussions. But on this occasion, the women themselves decided that they wanted to focus on themselves and their, and their journeys and their well being. In this case, uh, Anastasia Pelias, to do this abstract painting inspired in Sirita, she started reading everything that Sirita read during her, her stay in the prison system. She also made a painting inspired by the, Sirita's favorite colors. The canvas spans, the size of the canvas is the size of, of Sirita opening her arms and extending herself. And, uh, and for Anastasia, this painting shows a lot of the dynamism and, and force and uh, expansiveness that, that Sarita uh, embodies in, in, her, in her being, in her, her personality. It's, it's very dynamic. You'll, you'll enjoy a lot meeting Sarita, a um, really remarkable woman. And this piece also, we don't have a quote from Bobby Jean. I don't think we can see the top. The top is, um, uh, is a crown made of, of guns. This is a quote by Ron Therim, who is the artist that did this piece for uh, Bobby Jean Johnson. He said, there are many parallels between chess and life. This piece, this sculpture is a queen piece of a chess game. And so he explains why he chose that. He says, there are many parallels between chess and life, polar battles of race and class, pol policing strategies, and in this case, a queen's sacrifice. At 19, Bobby Jean was coerced to confess, yet maintained, she was, maintained her innocence. After 41 years, she was exonerated and she is now free. Well, Bobby Jean was actually not exonerated. She had to plead guilty in order for her to receive a pardon and a clemency, which still, um, it, it, it's still not the outcome that she wanted, but certainly there's evidence that she was, and that's why she was received clemency. She was coerced into a false confession. And so this piece, let me explain to you, it has like these uh, 18 slats, slates of, of wood, 19, which are, the, which are the number of years that Bobby Jean lived outside of the prison system. Then there has this pillow, uh, a very royal pillow carrying this crown, but the crown is made of, of um, woven um, purses and guns. And on top of like one of these like mirror cases with, with powder for women's makeup. And this tells a little bit the story of how Bobby Jean ended up in the prison system. She was in a car uh, with a, with a a young man and there was the police stopped them. And when the police stopped them for a traffic, uh, for a traffic or the car was being was being marked, I can't remember now exactly. But um, unbeknownst to her, this young man put a gun in Bobby Jean's purse. And so once they're taken into the police custody, they find this gun with which a crime had been committed in Bobby Jean's purse. And then she gets tortured and a confession comes. And what she confesses actually uh, does not really match the crime, but she ends up in the prison system for 40 years. So Bobby Jean went into the prison system as a 19 
old, young, healthy woman. And when she came out, when we met her, we met her a month after she was released. She had, uh, she was on dialysis. Her kidneys had failed. She had a, and she had uh, suffered hepatitis C inside the prison system, which speaks to the 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 healthcare, the lack or or in the lack thereof of healthcare in the prison system for a lot of these women that consider that that, for example, can be like a, a death sentence. That it's not what they received, you know, uh, when when the judge made their their sentences. Um, Bobby, D, Bobby Jean did die of, of her health issues during the run of the, of the Persister exhibition. And uh, the interview that we did with her, the interview that she did with um, Ram Therim, and also we did record them both meeting and, and Ram Therim revealing the piece to Bobby Jean for the first time. And we have all that documentation and it's a uh, and it's a great testament to Bobby Jean's life. It's a, some, it's a, it's a, had we not incurred in this project, we would have not gotten the nuanced story from Bobby Jean and her lawyers and her family. And so this is just to say that this is also another very important aspect of the socially engaged exhibitions where we are working with, with people, humans, and, uh, and their stories. And they have this added responsibility to the venue, to the curators, to anyone that's involved in those kind of projects. Uh, what did we find out from all our research and from all the interviews? That the vast majority of women in jail are not there for violent offenses. They're there for missing their probation and parole uh, citations, for having not paid traffic fines, for um, shoplifting, Dolphinette, for example, she will tell you herself, but she went in uh, for seven years, I believe, for shoplifting, uh, for drug offenses. And 18% of the women in the prison system are there for violent offenses. But we need to keep in mind that a violent offense is not necessarily human against human. It can be a violent offense against a building. It can be a violent offense against property or some sort of vandalizing. And so some of these 18% um, also are there for retaliating against a domestic abuse situation. So from, from the data that we, from, from the research that we did and, and the stories of the women, basically they match, right? Like the reports and the data and all of these numbers that, that tell us kind of like where the system stands, but they're not really humanizing, you know, telling us in particular, uh, how is this impacting our communities to the, to some of these infographics that we saw that, that, that are in the exhibition have the data from reports, but the testimonials of the persisters. And we were uh, marrying these two, two worlds of, of information through these infographics that had the intention of being very accessible to, um, to different audiences. So we looked at uh, uh, root causes. We never asked the women, you know, what did you do? If they wanted to tell us their, their interviews, they were welcome to, but that was not the focus of our, of our uh, research. The focus was, what are the root causes? What was your economic, your social, your family situation? What were the challenges you were suffering? And, you know, Sarita sums it up where she says, you know, Ultimately, women are being criminalized be because of, of fighting back to some situations that, that don't serve them well anymore. She was mentioning when we interviewed her at the time, she said, I went to clemency hearings last week and 10 of the 11 women were there for domestic abuse, were there for domestic abuse survivors, and all 10 of them were there serving life sentences for standing up to their abusers. We saw, we saw that in our interviews, we see that in the data and we saw that also in the interviews. The exhibition, if it follows uh, the guide, the, the way that it was shown at Newcomb and also at Michigan State, does provide uh, for two minutes of each one of the women's uh, for the public to listen directly. So the exhibition in terms of a curatorial perspective, we wanted to have these infographics, but we also wanted to make sure that we had different levels of engagement, that if anyone wanted to listen directly from the women, they could have that access to that information. But if they felt that they didn't want to do that emotional labor, it does require emotional labor on both parties, particularly the women and the persisters, um, that they could then then um, access those stories through the metaphors that the artists had created for the journeys of the women, or a step more removed, you know, look into the text panels that, that the, muse the museum curators had, had created for the exhibition. And one step further removed, there was a timeline 
in the case of, uh, in both cases in Michigan and at Newcom and also at the Ford Foundation where we also showed this exhibition, there was a timeline with information of important dates that had impacted the criminal justice system in terms of changes in policy that had then equally impacted the women. So just one more infographic letting on us know some of the root causes for women ending up in the prison system. The other, uh, and with the help of Sarita and Dolphinet, we identified these four themes. One was root causes. The other one was, you know, the impact of incarcerated mothers, how mothers, how did the mothers themselves felt about, about this circumstance? And some of them, this is Tremika, number two. Uh, this, the painting is Tremika having to uh, induce her labor um, some a month before going into the prison system. She didn't want to give birth in the prison system. So this is a, a Butch Frost painting showing how Tremika had to, you know, as soon as a baby was born, she had to separate herself from her baby and go into the prison system. And what we see here in the back in this window actually is the Superdome, is a New Orleans uh, football stadium that was in the news constantly during Katrina. And so the story of Tramika and several of the women of this exhibition is also the story of Hurricane Katrina, where they were um, incarcerated in a facility that was flooding and 11 of them actually were saved by a warden that decided to go back and, and find other, uh, another facility to house them. And after doing that, this warden then went and evacuated with, with her family. But had not been for that warden, you know, maybe some of those women would not be here with us today. So those are, those are, the interviews actually are archived at Newcomb. There's about two hours for each one of the women and we have the stories of Katrina. But what is what is in the exhibition, the, 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 the two minutes is more related to these four themes that we identified together with Sirita and Dolphinet. The other thing that we wanted to know from the women was their experience in the prison system. And Sirita will let you know that the prison system was designed after the military system and for men. And so nothing of how the criminal justice system has been designed in origin, nothing has been designed to really serve the needs of women. And so uh, through the interviews, of course, this is corroborated. And um, uh, uh, for example, this piece that we see here is a piece uh, dedicated to uh, Tonja Isaac, who uh, just saw a lot of her colleagues in her cell, in her, in her community inside the prison system suffer of health issues. She herself, when she came out of the prison system, well, had breast cancer, advanced stages. She's doing way better. Uh, she's doing very well. But there was just, um, there's, there's a lack of uh, healthcare for women, right? There's a lack of prenatal care, um, postnatal care, care for, for pregnant moms. The way that some women have to give birth is still uh, with handcuffs. There's, uh, they're separate by their children, in many cases after 48 hours. There's uh, very little mammogram services for the women, you know, all these, all these uh, issues that would serve the mind and the body of women to be able to live with dignity uh, are lacking in the prison system. So, so these chap some of these interviews highlight that. This piece of Tanja is actually one of my favorites. It's a, it's a wallpaper piece, like the, the, the pattern that you see on the back is wallpaper. And then you see these portraits of families, uh, except that the mother is in a uniform, right? So it speaks to this, this uh, motherhood, you know, inside the prison system. It's kind of an abstract. So it actually represents particular families, but it represents also the demographics of, of the women in the prison system. And the, um, and the artist made sure that, that it reflected that women of color are overrepresented in the prison system. If we look at our demographics, who we are as a country, and the percentage of those different races, ethnicities are overrepresented in the prison system. So we are targeting you know, people of color um, and we are incarcerating predominantly people of color. And that's the data that's available to us. It's interesting that the, the feeling of this artwork, when you see it in the museum, it looks like an embroidery. It looks like it's made of fabric. But then we look at it and it's actually a digital print. It's digitally made. So that is because um, this, the whole mural is made with screenshots of computer, of online stores that sell garments fabricated and produced inside the prison system by incarcerated folks. 
Tanya Isaacson in her interview explains that, that she worked in the garment industry and that she actually enjoyed it, that she found a lot of pleasure uh, while being incarcerated, you know, uh, sewing the, the necks and the edges of the t-shirts uh, for these companies that, that use uh, uh, incarcerated labor to actually have access to cheap labor. And so that's why this mural. So I like this piece by Amy Elkins because it talks about demographics, it talks about families, it talks about mothers, but it also talks about the labor that we see takes place in the prison system, which could be also a whole subject on its own about you know, access to really um, almost unpaid labor uh, for incarcerated individuals, which was, is one of the incentives to continue mass incarceration, incentives for for-profit for um, individuals to continue the situation of mass incarceration in the United States. The fourth theme that we explored in the exhibition in, um, was what, what, what are the challenges of reentry? And I think that the, um, when we had the exhibition at Newcomb, particularly uh, because the women live there and their, their lawyers that had defended them would come to the exhibition and they would see their clients in this new light, a lot of nonprofit, their, their children. But for, it was interesting to me, for example, that the lawyers that had defended the women and had helped them get you know, their clemencies or, or get released or uh, help them transition to reentry were unaware of the challenges of the reentry to society. The fact that a lot of the women are giving a check for of $20 to cash, but many of them don't have an ID that is valid. Uh, they don't, they don't um, have access to a phone to call their family members, et cetera. So a lot of those challenges are explained in the exhibition. And, uh, and for example, this, this quote by Zina, where, you know, uh, where sometimes there's the, the, inside the prison system, there's this lack of, of optimism towards uh, the future of the women, you know? So like Zina, when she left, someone told her, oh, you will be back. What women like Sirita and Dolphinette, who you will be meeting soon, uh, are doing is that they're actually creating nonprofits to help these women transition to reentry society, but to meet them where they are, right? There's a lot of assumption of what the women need when they come out of the prison system, and it's actually not accurate. And I, I'm sure Sirita and Dolphinette will talk more about that. But that, what, that is why it's important to have directly impacted individuals be invested in, and participate at every single level of the criminal justice reform and the re-entry situation. So anyway, you will see several of the exhibitions or several of the comments and the infographics talk about those challenges of re-entry. And so it was, uh, what this exhibition also did behind the scenes was create this community, right? Create, build this community of like 30 artists and, and museums, uh, museum professionals and about 14 students and 20 faculty members. In total, about 120 individuals contributed their expertise, their time, their stories to this exhibition. And a lot of us were uh, highly uneducated on, on the facts of mass incarceration in the United States. So one of the things that we did was build bridges where bridges were not there and create this community where uh, you know we become more aware of, of the concerns and the obstacles that, that um, our communities are, are seeing. And, and we found a way to move forward together. I have to say that um, uh, there's been a shift in, uh, in order to, to elicit, start eliciting change in the criminal justice system, local elections are very, very important. And I will say that after the New Orleans exhibition in New Orleans, they, uh, they voted recently for a district attorney that is looking in, came to see the exhibition and is because he's interested and aware of these issues, but that some things are starting to change at a local level in Louisiana and it's bringing this awareness of where we can elicit change and um, and and more um, and more discussions and more education. The other thing that we did is we offered the museum for our partners to use as their platform for their meetings with their members, with their uh, with their boards. Uh, in this case, um, the the one from Women with a Vision had received a, an award, and she received the award in the exhibition. And so, uh, being able to to pre pre present these journeys. And what the one told us, the one told us from, from using our exhibition as a platform was that how much she valued this storytelling tool that is so important, how these, these narratives and these metaphors telling in just beautiful visual images, challenging stories of the women that just elevated 
uh, the narrative and that that was so beneficial for them, for everyone to kind of understand not only the mission that some of these uh, nonprofits had, but also the individual journey of each one of the women. Other things that we that are different from a normal art exhibition to this exhibition, we added, uh, we, you know, with the timeline that we had in the floor, we actually, you know, branched it out literally to allow for directly impacted people to insert in these official timelines the dates that are important to them. We see that a lot of timelines, timelines in history, just give us those day, this, this information, but it really, they, it doesn't really track the effects that some of these. Uh, changes having people. So we we added the timeline. We added also the messages in in the envelope that we scan and we send back to the prison system to share with our colleagues there and with our partners there. And then uh, each one of the persisters received a portrait. The portraits that we selected for the exhibition were were somewhat introspective. They were the women looking at their at their own stories. But during the photo session, we had a lot of photos taken by the women. And in many of those photos, we caught them smiling and, and cracking up. So we made up a, a, a copy of that photo. And uh, all of the women received their own portraits smiling uh, for, for, their own, for their own homes. Uh, this is the, the exercise of the envelopes, um, the message in the envelope, where we're encouraging folks to send messages to the communities that helped us uh, produce this exhibition and that many of them are inside the prison system. That's what the exhibition looked like at the Michigan State University. I like this photo because it shows us several strategies and several levels of engagement that you can have when you visit the exhibition. You can listen directly from the women and generally, I'm not sure how it plays out in Syracuse, but generally the, the sound interviews where you can listen to them are, are near to where the portraits are. Then we have the infographics. In the case of uh, Newcomb and Michigan, we had stickers with some of these infographics because the students requested stickers to pass around and put on their computers. We have the artworks. And we also have, not sure how it will play out in, in Syracuse, but we also have these videos where we recorded about seven of the pairings of the persister with their artist in front of the work discussing the work, right? Discussing how they met, how they built trust, how they collaborated with the uh, art of uh, creating the art object and what you know the result was for them and what the whole process meant for them so if those are not available in the exhibition they're certainly available in the persister website where a lot of this information is available to all of you so we also have we started including the like post exhibition content right like how did the persisters receive this exhibition it's presented in those videos and so again when we're talking about socially engaged exhibitions, you know, there's, there's a, there, we need to be aware that it just does not end, our work doesn't end when, when we close the exhibition. There's still a lot more work to be done, particularly in this case when the exhibitions travel. These are some examples of, you know, uh, the artists themselves, the persisters on their panels. These are the uh, panel we did with the, with the lawyers that defended uh, a lot of the women and um, performances, et cetera, et cetera. I see there's some folks in the chat. Uh, I'm going to hurry up so that we can have a conversation. A lot of folks have told us that the exhibition was uh, very emotional, but it was also transformational, that it was very important for them to realize that they didn't know uh, and that now they do, that it was educational and that it was necessary. Um, a lot of participation and folks wanting to, to um, reach out. We also shared a lot of information of the nonprofits that do really good work with these communities so that folks could start getting in, uh, in, um, invested in them. And I, uh, I think the last thing I wanna say is that they're actually, we doubled and tripled attendance numbers. We, we doubled attendance numbers for our opening and the uh, numbers, we did not triple attendance numbers. We doubled attendance numbers and there is a need. Like our communities want to know about these issues. They want to learn more about each other. We want to build these communities and build bridges between our communities. And uh, we want to give back. And there's something that uh, I just want to bring up because a lot of folks were a little bit hesitant. It's like, oh, what, what will a mass incarceration in the United States exhibition look like? And how will the visitor feel? And, you know, it is actually, it's a tremendous success. It's an exhibition that talks about our community, helps us understand it, and helps us rehumanize, you know, uh, pockets of communities that we don't tend to uh, coincide or have access to. And it's building those new bridges where they're where they were not there before. Uh, this is my last slide, and it's just to comment that the responsibility of doing these uh, socially engaged exhibitions, like I said, continues beyond the exhibition. 
when we brought Persister to Michigan, we knew that the first question was going to be, well, what about Michigan, right? Because Persister is focused on women and many of them right now are grounded in Louisiana, even though their experiences um, includes the, the rest of the nation. But so we decided to, we had to, it was our response, we felt it was a responsibility to do an exhibition on uh, incarceration in Michigan, which is called Free Your Mind. And some of the feedback we got from Persister was like, where is the art of currently incarcerated individuals and artists? So the exhibition Free Your Mind addresses that. It was all art made inside the prison system in Michigan. And it looked at the aspects of Michigan, but we also had a show on black and white photographies made with pinhole cameras, which is a low tech kind of camera uh, by youth currently living in correctional facilities. And we wanted to make sure we were documenting that life of these of, of these youth and equally we had a we had a 12 of these scale models here uh, that were done by youth aging out of the foster care system where they got to envision what kind of spaces they would like to inhabit in their lives like who, who would they want to be and what kind of environment would be good for them and so uh, we showed that as well and we also showed an exhibition called silenced it was about the experience of Michiganders in isolation and confinement. We still have that practice where we put folks in isolation for years and years and 30, 40 years. And we had an, an, the exhibition from, from folks that have gone through that experience telling us what it was about and uh, a lot of advocates advocating for the abolition of that isolation and confinement. And then we had a, an exhibition space um, um, across the street from the museum that is uh, where we collaborate with communities. We give that space to our community fellows. So this exhibition here uh, that was called Returning Citizens was completely self-organized by formerly incarcerated artists. And they were allowed to sell their own work and, and you know, again, meet, meet, uh, take over the space and, and just create how they wanted to be represented. At, at every level. And so um, I would like to start a, a conversation. I, I think that's more or less everything I wanted to share with you all, but I would love to, you know, get some questions or some comments if you feel like it, um, if there's any questions. Thank you for um, that presentation, Monica. It was so, um interesting and enlightening to hear about the, the kind of process of organizing such a community um, engaged exhibition. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it felt to see the exhibition come together in the galleries and actually seeing all of these works whose stories that you've lived with for so long, like in the same place for the first time? Right. It was very emotional, I have to say. I mean, I, I have to say that the emotional labor that everybody did for this exhibition, right? Because, um, you know, the museum made a lot of assumptions and we we were called on to remedying in those at every single step of the way. So we learned a lot and that kind of learning is difficult, but it's the most important one we need to be doing. And so I remember a point in the exhibition process where Sirita and Dolphine, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start doing the layout, you know? Um, and they were like, you know what? No, that's your area of expertise, we've, you know, We've course corrected you all, you know, all the way here, but now we want you to sort, this is your expertise, surprise us. So by the day of the opening, I was really waiting to see what the, you know, how folks were receiving the, the exhibition and the artworks. And I think for the persisters also, they had explained, you know, the worst chapters of their lives to us through the interviews. And then they had done that again with their artists and they just didn't know what to expect either, you know, how was their life going to be interpreted by, by, you know, this project. And so it was, they were, they were, uh, some of them were shaking to be honest. Right. And, and they were, they were very pleased because they were able to see their lives through these be the beautiful lens of the arts and these beautiful metaphors. Um, uh, it was a beautiful exhibition also because with the artists, we just gave them free reign. We were like, you know the responsibility that this is. You know, you're super talented artists and you know the responsibility of representing someone's life and doing it accurately. And so the artists were also nervous to see how everyone was going to be receiving their art. But I think a beautiful thing was that uh, this exhibition at, at, towards the end was, was accomplished by pure trust. Like we would, like we did not know what the artists were gonna come back to deliver to us, but we knew they had, you know, you have eight eight feet of wall here, and whatever you bring us, we're gonna hang it, and we fully trust that it's going to be 
remarkable, which was the case. And so it was almost like a festival kind of, of, of a gathering where we were all just so proud that, that we did it. It was, it was not an easy process and that the result was, uh, was just very emotional for, for everyone, I have to say. And thank you, Melissa, for your question. Well, thank you for your answer. Um, are, th are there any other questions from our audience today? Well, if not, I have another question because um, it's been wonderful working with this material here at Syracuse. Um, so through this exhibition, you've really highlighted the importance of partnering with um, community organizations um, and developing this trust. And one thing I struggle with in my own curatorial practice is how to meaningfully continue this partnership once the exhibition is no longer on view. So do you have any um, thoughts about that or any advice to share? Right. Um, you know, evidently 120 people helped us put this exhibition together. And uh, I would say maybe I keep touch with about 10 of them. I think it helps to keep the commitment that every time there's an article, every time there's something happening on, on this subject matter, that we send back the information to, to the persisters and the community, that's been important. Uh, you know, Sarita and I continue to touch base, you know, um, not that often, but I would say like every two months or so. Um, I think it's it helps when your commitment is structural, where, when it's already embedded. I mean, of course, there's a personal commitment, but there's also, if you force yourself, if you build that commitment into the structures of your institution, right? And you will, you will be, um, you will be reminded that these that that it's the time to send you know this information to the persisters, send them back the the photos, the publications, all of that. All of that uh, was built into these formal agreements. And so I think if if you can go about it both ways, and one way will reinforce the other one, that helps. It is certainly a kind of exhibition that that we can only do you know every every two years or so in the museum because precisely it is about building trust and building relationships and 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 building bridges where they were none. And so that takes a, but once those build, I mean, Melissa, I think that once those buildings are, bridges are built, there's no way back. You know, you will continue to have that, that exchange. And for example, here in Michigan, the doing the exhibition of Free Your Mind, I thought like, well, it's gonna take me four more years to reach out to the formerly incarcerated community and, and you know, to build a trust. What happened was that many of them had seen the persister exhibition through Zoom, you know, they were aware through Instagram and through all these digital programs. So when I reached out to them, they were like, oh, we know exactly who you are and we actually want to work with you. So while you can keep on your, your, you know, your relationship with the folks that got us here, what is very beautiful is that you're building credibility and trust with other communities yet to come, right? And that many, what you will probably see, Melissa, is that a lot of directly impacted folks in Syracuse that you have not met before are gonna be reaching out to you. And so through, through an exhibition that was made in Louisiana, you're gonna be able to reach out to your own community. And that just remains there, right? And also not only the trust as an individual, which is very important and you know we all, we all grow. I mean, that's what life is about, but also um, the, um, there's someone in the waiting room, I think. Should we, I mean, anyway. Um, the institutional trust, right? Like I also think that once you build this personal bridge, when the institutions actually show this commitment to, to underrepresented communities that seldom see themselves on the museum walls, there's no going back either. So I think what's important is like, well, maybe I cannot, I, I'm not able to keep up like a, 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 a deep relationship with like the 30 persisters and the 30 artists. What there is, is that there is that memory that we all did something great together. Uh, and and there's that transformation. I mean, for all of us, these these projects is visiting the the exhibition. You will see when you talk to Siri and Dolphinet, there's a before and after. And what we all remember is this transformational experience and who facilitated it. And that will remain, and that will come back. You know, and we don't know if it's like okay, maybe it's not this month, but certainly that's something that you will be carrying forward as an institution, as an individual. That's uh, very um, satisfying. Thank you for that, uh, Monica. Um, that that gives me great hope in really thinking about how um, 
in this world that I've only occupied for such a short period of time to really think about how to forge those connections and how to really um, can continue to nurture those connections. So yeah. thank you for that. My pleasure, Melissa. And one other thing, um, as you go into this journey, if uh, working with, with community was also, you know, realizing that, that a lot of the curatorial work is not done in the office, it's not via email, it's actually going to where the women are physically and um, sitting down with coffee with them there, them realizing that they need childcare to come to our meetings, uh, realizing that sometimes they... Um, they have support systems that that come that have to come with them if you want them to join you for something that's uncertain to them. So sometimes we were planning, you know, for a brunch, we would do this every month, we would get together for a brunch and like report, you know, where we were. And sometimes they would show up with, you know, five, six family members because that's what they needed for, for the participation. And that was also their support system. So, so start like observing that, like what, what are the obstacles that we can remove or where can we be welcoming? Right. And so instead of planning for 30 persisters to, to visit us, we were planning for like, well, we will have probably a hundred folks. If everything goes well, best case scenario, we'll have a hundred folks showing up and be prepared for, for that welcoming of, of them and their support system. And, um, you know, if they needed help with transportation costs, same thing, you know, things like that, that, that are in the end are like little things, but that mm -hmm. you are observing the obstacles and their needs and you're tending to them. And, um, and, and that, that delicacy uh, in that process uh, is, is what these kind of projects need. That's very different from curating art uh, from an art history book or the, the, the studio visit with the artist and then back to your office. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, are there other questions from our audience? I have a, a quick question, Monica. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious how you, um, because the show first premiered at the Newcomb, which is an academic museum. It went to your current museum at the Broad and now it's here at Syracuse. Um, but it's dealing so much about grounded issues in maybe a certain geographic area where there are these transient communities of students who have a four year span where they're coming in and coming out. Um, I'm curious how you feel about, you know, you know, I think that there's a lot of pros to that because they absorb this information, they learn from it, they take action and they can take it to broader, like as they leave, say okay. Syracuse. Um, but I'm just curious of your, you know, how, how your institutions were able to feel like you made a difference at an academic museum setting um, and how involved, like how much community um, was able to come in and hopefully was able to, you know, catch those transit students, transit faculty, visiting fellows, and also connect to the direct community um, that you're geographically located in. Right. Uh, that's a very good question, you know, because the idea was to, we, we actually reached out to a lot of um, folks teaching freshman classes. We had a lot of support from the provost. I mean, of course, the university was very aware that we were doing this and that there were um, students engaged and working, you know, with, with formerly incarcerated women, etc. And the provost of the university came and several deans, I think we had about seven deans come to the opening. So all of that, because we had so many faculty from different faculties, psychology, history, social science, architecture, art, photography, you know, um, we had a lot of the faculty involved and therefore their, their deans were aware. So, so it, it, it was both ways. It was like reaching out to the community and, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to key opinion leaders and community stakeholders off campus and personally inviting them. And then it was also personally inviting the provost and the deans who came to the exhibition and saw their faculty and saw the students. I think also once you have students engaged in the production of a project, the whole university is kind of invested. So there's like a, <laughs> this is a good tool for. Um, and so I, it, it is of my opinion that, that we need to offer this kind of experience or this kind of knowledge, particular of our own communities to students that will be making a change and that will, they will be inheriting these situations. And that, and that we need to operate differently from, you know, let's say that your, your typical contemporary art museum that's showing what's up, what's next, you know, and now it's an NFTs or whatever, you know, like what's next, what's next. And I think that academic museums were so grounded. We have such a core audience already and with such deep knowledge and, and, and deep resources that I think that maybe what we can do is do these kind of exhibitions every four years, like 
why don't we talk about mass incarceration every four years? And that was the model at Newcom. And Newcom is following up. Uh, we did several meetings before Persister came down with the same community and we said, okay, what's next? We focused on women, what's next? And the community decided youth. We need to focus on youth. And I, I believe that Newcom now is developing uh, with the same partners, except that different players now. So same, same folks at the table, but like some folks that are now have more expertise in, in, in youth are the ones that are contributing with like the concepts. And so I, I think that every four years we should do and and, uh, and, it, and four years is what it takes to start from scratch. It's what it took us for Persister. But I also think that maybe every four years we need to talk about you know, climate change and uh, global warming and, you know, things that are happening that as the scholarship, are, um, are, I mean, one exhibition just doesn't do it. I mean, this is just scratching the surface. So why don't we program every four years so that we can carry the knowledge and the partners that we developed in such depth? And like you were saying, Melissa, how do we keep them engaged? Well, you keep them engaged because four years from now, so that you can cycle together with the undergrad kind of cycle, and be able to have every undergrad that goes through that university be able to have access to these kind of exhibitions. And they will be different. Like in Michigan, we did five more exhibitions besides Persister uh, that all had to do with mass incarceration. Each one of them had a different focus. And we, we continue that discussion. We continue to build community. We continue to build those trust and we continue to focus on, on items. And I think that focus is important for, for issues that are so overwhelming. Right. You start looking at mass incarceration and it's just like, how, how does the bail bond system, what's the labor like? It's a, you know, it's like so uh, ominous, right? And so I think this like, let's focus and let's continue the whole community engage. And each time some, someone else will take the stage, but we're all moving together. Um, and now that you've delivered, right? Like you've already shown by, by you know, showing this exhibition that you're committed, it's gonna make it way easy to start making those rounds now with, with your community. But anyway, long story short, I think that we should cycle every four years and, and continue the investigation, continue, you know, as long as this is an issue, which will be for, for many years, you know, inequity will be there for many years. As long as that's an issue that precludes us all to move forward together, with equity, then we, we have to cyclically continue these discussions. They're not, they're not gonna go away. We need to find solutions. We need to educate ourselves and, um, and move away from like the, the society of spectacle, right? Like what's next and what's the next shiny thing? No, let's regather and what, what is important, not what's next, but what is important. And then let's start unpacking that through the years. That would, that's, that, you know, that's how I approach these kind of projects. Thank you. And on that note of continuing um, this conversation, um, first, I would like to thank Monica again for this overview of this important exhibition. And I um, would like to invite all of you to return to Zoom on Wednesday, February 9th at 3 p.m. to join me in conversation with, um, as Monica has already um, referred, um, alluded to, um, in conversation with the persisters and the co-producers of the exhibition, Dolphinette Martin and Sarita Steib. Um, for registration information for that event and further details about our full slate of programming around Persister, um, please visit our website, museum.syr.edu slash calendar. Thank you all again for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next event and hopefully also at the museum. Thank you, Melissa and Emily, for giving the Persisters yet another life, another, another way to share their stories that empower them as well every time you know, they see themselves valued in that manner. So thank you so much. Looking forward to your program with Sirita and Dolphinette. <laughs> thank you, Monica. Bye. Thank you, Monica. Have a good weekend.